Will you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this time that we get to remember. Remember the great sacrifice. We thank you for the freedom that we get to have here in America. Holy Spirit, keep us awake tonight. Keep us alert as your word is declared. Help us to remember in a very personal way all that your sacrifice means for us. Pray, Father, that everything that is said and done in this place tonight brings you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start tonight by asking you to imagine something with me. I want you to imagine hiking on a trail. And at times it's extremely difficult and it leaves you exhausted. There are bugs biting you. You're hungry. You're thirsty. The trail is overgrown in places. There are tree roots and boulders and potholes threatening to trip you up. So you have to be careful. You have to walk very intentionally so you don't twist an ankle and uh, fall. But you push on. You're walking this seeming endless trail, trying to ignore the impulse to quit and go back. And then just about the time that you're ready to give in to the temptation to turn around, you come across this magnificent, beautiful scene that's beautiful. Maybe it's a waterfall or a sparkling creek or you're on top of the mountain and you're looking down over thousands of treetops. Or maybe you just stumbled upon a lake in the middle of nowhere. You stop and you listen to the sound of birds, the water pulsating down the waterfall or splashing over rocks. Or maybe you hear the wind whistling through the trees. You find out you could spend hours just basking in this beautiful, peaceful atmosphere. Eventually, though, it's time to turn around and go back down the trail, back through the bugs, back through the potholes, over logs and roots. But there's a difference this time. Now you walk back with this vivid memory of what you've just experienced, what you've just been watching, this beauty and this magnificence. See, for me, that's a bit like this Lenten season. It can be a long, six-week, arduous, emotional, and spiritual hike that started back with Ash Wednesday. We've listened carefully to testimonies of those who knew and walked with Jesus. And it hasn't been easy to hear the prosecuting attorney badger and insinuate that Jesus wasn't all that. We've heard the defense attorney clarify and remind us of what we believe. We've remembered what it might have been like back then. It's easy to give up during Lent. To think it's too hard, too boring, too many church services, too time-consuming, too this, too that. Yet here we are, and it is Holy Week, and we are walking through Jesus' last days on earth. Now by this time, back then, Jesus had already sent his disciples ahead to prepare the Passover meal, and he would join them later that evening to celebrate his Last Supper. By this time, Judas had already met with the chief priests, offering to hand Jesus over for 30 pieces of silver. And so, as we keep walking tonight, Maundy Thursday, we're going to come upon an incredible, beautiful view. I don't want to give it away just yet, so I'm going to continue on, and if you have your Bibles, um, all of the details are in Matthew 26. Now, Passover was a time to remember God's faithfulness, to retell the story of the exodus from Egypt, to reclaim the promise of the covenant. So think about the atmosphere in the room that night. It was probably much like some of you experienced in the fellowship hall just a little bit earlier. Or it's like our celebrations with friends and family at Thanksgiving and Christmas and soon Easter. It's a bit loud, right? Everyone's talking at the same time, enjoying food and fellowship. See, in the room that night, the disciples were celebrating, laughing, sharing stories, enjoying their meal when Jesus suddenly interrupted them with some show-stopping news. 
He said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Imagine the mood shift suddenly going from celebratory to sorrowful. The Bible tells us they were all greatly distressed at this news. Of course they were. They loved Jesus. How could this be? And then one by one, all except one of them, Judas, asked their friend, Is it me? Am I the one Lord? Lord, by using that title, shows us how much reverence they had for Jesus. They acknowledged his power and his authority over them. He was their Lord and their master. Yeah, they were friends, but he was the boss. And though Jesus didn't reveal who would betray him at, at their questioning, he did reiterate that one of them in the room, one who had just eaten out of the same bowl as he did, he was the one. He went on to say that the Son of God needed to die as it was written and how terrible it would be for that one who betrayed him. So dreadful, in fact, that it would have been better if he were not born. It was then that Judas spoke up and said, Rabbi, is it I? Judas identified with him as teacher, not as Lord, not as one who had authority over him. And we know that he would later regret that decision as well as his actions. Judas's betrayal serves as a warning to every one of us at how easy it is to be on, on board one minute and out of the boat the next minute. How easy it is for us to dip our fingers into the same bowl as Jesus, to worship him publicly, serve him, walk with him, and yet betray him with our thoughts and our words and our actions. We ought to remember how this one man who walked with Jesus, talked with him face to face, served by his side, could betray him so that we don't do the same. Jesus merely responded to Judas's question, it is as you say. He didn't beat him over the head with truth or try to further embarrass him. He knew what Judas was thinking, even though Judas wouldn't admit it. Jesus knows what each one of you is thinking right now. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows what we've done right, and he knows what we've done wrong. And he does not beat us over the head with his truth, or he does not try to embarrass us. Instead, he provides a meal, and he invites us to his table. And he tells us to remember him as we come to commune. What we do with his invitation, whether we choose to obey and remember him, is up to us. Now, as odd as it seems to me, after receiving this news of betrayal, the disciples go right back to eating. And just as their attention is once again returned to the food before them, here it is, that incredible view I told you about. Jesus saying to his disciples and to us for all generations, take eat. This is my body. Take drink. This is my blood. That should pause us on this laborious journey that we're on. That should make us take time to experience God's grace every single time we hear those words. You see, this meal that we're going to celebrate, this means of grace, is a way that we get to experience God's tangible grace right here on earth. It's a way that we get to meet and commune with God and with each other. Like the disciples, it is a way that we literally dip our fingers into his body and into his blood. It's a time for us to stop for a while on this hike, this journey of life, and bask in the beauty before us. It reads like this from Matthew 26, 26 to 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Remember, Judas is right there. 
For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. When we celebrate communion, we are coming into union with Jesus. We are remembering to live in the relationship that we share with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, we read that he says to do this in remembrance of me. Now let's remember that even back then, sin was running rampant. Before and after Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. Judas had already put the betrayal into motion. And he would later give Jesus a kiss to solidify that act. Jesus was arrested like a common criminal and dragged off in the middle of the night to answer to the chief priests. Peter would deny him three times, saying he never knew Jesus, even though he had told Jesus boldly, I will never do that. The disciples would stumble and fall, sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane. They would all deny him. You see, this wasn't an easy walk in the park for them. It wasn't an easy walk in the park for Jesus, and it is not an easy walk in the park for us today. The road that they were on was tough. It tested their endurance and their faith often. Life in Christ is often grueling and demanding. We will often be pushed to the point of wanting to give up and turn around because our journey in this world is very often contradictory to our faith. Yet Holy Communion is set in the midst of a tumultuous world in the thick of ambiguity and conflict, in the center of lives that are filled with flaws and stains and shame and betrayal and fear. Communion is not set for people without sin, for people who think they've got it all together. It's set for people who believe that Jesus is all that and more. The disciples didn't have it all together all the time. I sure don't, and hopefully you don't either. But God does. And so Jesus takes bread and wine, his body and his blood, and he gives them to us in the midst of our messy lives, sharing himself with us. He invites us to come to him right where we're at in the midst of this journey. So here we are tonight. Maybe you, like me, have been struggling through life making your way through some really difficult terrain and stumbling from time to time. You're tired, you're wore out, the bugs have been biting you, and you wonder if you're going to make it through. Or more than that, maybe you wonder if it's worth it. But here you are, you've made it to the table of the Lord. This is your time, this is our time to stop and to bask in the incredible mystery and beauty of what's going to happen in a few minutes. It's time to let Holy Spirit search your heart and for you to examine your heart, what's going on in you as you journey through life. It's time to get real. It's time to confess your sin, to surrender, to forgive other people, to repent, and to receive his forgiveness. See, sometimes... We get so caught up and engaged in this journey of life, we don't stop to enjoy the presence of God. We accept Jesus' invitation to commune with him and each other, but we don't give it much thought. Sometimes when we, we're remembering lots of other things instead of remembering the price that Jesus paid for us. We just motor through communion, take it out of habit or just because it's offered. Sometimes we take it without even being cognizant of its significance. And by doing so, we miss an experience of God's tangible grace. We miss an opportunity to bask in his beauty. You see, coming to communion is like coming to an oasis, coming to a refuge on this grueling hike. Here, you will find forgiveness and refreshing and assurance. God uses bread and wine to help us remember that Jesus paid the price for us. He made the greatest sacrifice of all time so that as often as we eat and drink, we remember his body broken and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. When we take 
a piece of bread or a wafer in communion. We are remembering that through Christ's brokenness, we are made whole. We remember how much he loves us. So much so that he was willing to hang on a cross, to be beaten, whipped, mocked, scourged, laughed at, humiliated, rejected, and forsaken for us so that we will never be left alone, will never be forsaken by him. When we take and drink in communion, we remember it's the cup of his love spilling over into our hearts and our lives. And through the shedding of his blood, we know and experience forgiveness and restoration. Now in verse 30, we read that after Jesus shared his body and blood, they sung a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. You see, the journey continued, as it does for us every single time we leave that communion table. We touch his grace, we sing a new song, and then we get back out on the trail where the same roots, the same boulders are in place to trip us up, where the hike is still difficult. We'll still make mistakes, we'll still sin, just like those disciples. But friends, now it should be different because we have this vivid memory of what just happened, what we just get to experience, and we can return again and again and again. The disciples came around. We do too. There's always hope in Jesus. And so as we commune at his table tonight, I want you to take time to consider the depth that God reaches to in you, to communicate to you how much he wants to commune with you. That's breathtaking. Take time to bask in his presence and to remember, to be cognizant of Jesus when you take and eat and drink. You see, at that very moment that, that you take and eat and drink, you will experience the full impact of his sacrifice. It becomes real right then. The exchange is overwhelming. His suffering and death for your eternity. His great sacrifice for you to live in the new covenant in his blood shed for you for the forgiveness of every single one of your sins. Tomorrow night, our spiritual journey continues as we press on, taking time to remember and to relive Jesus' gruesome death on the cross. You might be thinking, really? Another church service? You might think it's unnecessary to remember and relive such a horrid event. You might be tempted to skip it because you've got Easter plans and Easter dinners to prepare for. You might be tempted to just show up on Easter morning for the good stuff. But please don't. Keep walking. Stay awake. Because the most beautiful view, the most beautiful view is almost in sight. Jesus' resurrection. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for being the great sacrifice. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for putting up with us. Thank you for your patience, for your kindness, and your good, goodness. I pray, Father, that everyone in this room would leave changed tonight as we remember and realize the full impact once again, of your death on that cross. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.